Ich studiere Federici, ist emeritierte Professorin an der Hofstra University im US-Bundesstaat New York und langjährige feministische und antikapitalistische Aktivistin. In den 70er Jahren war sie beteiligt an der äh, Wages for Housework oder Lohn für Hausarbeit Kampagne. Ähm, in den 80er Jahren hat sie in äh, Nigeria gelebt und dort die Auswirkungen der Strukturanpassungsprogramme äh, von IWF und Weltbank äh, unmittelbar beobachten können. Ähm, seit den 90er Jahren beschäftigt sie sich ähm, historisch und theoretisch mit ähm, den Epoche der Hexenverfolgung in Europa und auch außerhalb Europas. Und daraus ist das Buch hervorgegangen, was sozusagen der Ausgangspunkt dessen sein wird, was sie heute Abend uns vortragen wird. Das ist das Buch Caliban und die Hexe, was man am Büchertisch auch kaufen kann. Die englische Ausgabe ist Anfang der Nullerjahre erschienen, die deutsche Ausgabe im Jahr 2012, also vor relativ kurzer Zeit erst. Vielleicht erwähne ich noch, äh, Silvia Federici ist äh, lange mit, seit langer Zeit Mitglied im Midnight Notes Collective, im politisch-theoretischen Kollektiv in den USA und war in den letzten Jahren auch aktiv beteiligt an der Occupy-Bewegung in New York. Herzlich willkommen Silvia und damit hast du das Wort. Ganz kurz noch äh, wegen Übersetzung. Es gibt zwei Kanäle äh, für die Leute, die eine Übersetzung brauchen. Äh, Deutsch auf Kanal 1, Englisch auf Kanal 2. Good evening, and thank you for coming tonight. And I want to start by thanking, first of all, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for having organized this event and also for having brought me here and given me the possibility to be part you know, of the discussion of the next couple of days. Um, I'm very happy also that um, I've been asked to speak of the relationship between the witch hunts of the past, of particularly the 16th and 17th century, which have been the subject of um, much of my work, research, and the subject of Caliban and the witch, and uh, the ongoing war against women that uh, we can see in every aspect of life and that has been escalating you know, with the rise of neoliberalism. I'm very happy because I believe that looking at the witch hunts of the past can really shed much light on the present. And uh, unfortunately, we don't, know, don't always see that, and we do not see it because the witch hunts have been so distorted in their meaning. They have been you know, so concealed in their historical significance that it is very difficult for most people today to actually understand what they represented as a political, social, and historical phenomenon. And this is what briefly, schematically, I will try to do today. And in fact, I would even say that uh, the vision of the witch hunts that has prevailed, at least on a popular level, uh, has been the vision of the witch hunters. Uh, I was recently in northern Spain and southern France visiting villages where there were persecution and where there were trials and with great sadness, I realized that the whole commerce has been built you know, on the image of the witch 
so that you can have uh, many shops, tourist shops, you know, who are selling horrible dolls where the witch is represented exactly in the way that was manufactured by the, the witch hunter, you know, the, the old woman, the horrible with the long nose, with the very, with the grimace on her face, the broom among her legs, etc. So it's very important that uh, we move away from the image and rethink what this event represented that led to the death of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women and uh, you know, left, a, I believe, a very deep mark in our history, and particularly a deep mark in the construction of the social position of women. So I'm going to begin to look at what, in what way in particular, you know, the witch hunt can, of the 16th, 17th century, you know, can throw light on the present. Now, in Caliban and the Witch, which I hope you're going to read, uh, I've argued that um, the, this uh, men's persecution, really historically unprecedented, because there's no other example in history, you know, of a government, of a regime, you know, that launched such a war against women, and in particular, of a war coordinated in many, many countries at the same time, uh, targeting, you know, people that 90% of them were women. Now, I, I made the argument that, uh, you know, the witch hunt was um, a persecution that served many, many, uh, first of all, that it was a defining moment in the development of capitalist relations and that it was a persecution that had many objectives. You know, it served many purposes. And uh, first of all, it served to break the resistance of a whole population of peasants, artisans, who in the same period were also uh, being expropriated, you know, from the means of their production and reproduction. And the witch hunt was uh, really a terror campaign, you know, a, a campaign that spread terror, you know, both in the rural area and uh, in the urban center, and in the way weakened the resistance of people to processes of expropriation, which now we recognize as having been, you know, essential to the development of capitalism. But in particular, I want to concentrate on two elements of the witch hunt that I think are especially important to understand, you know, the relationship, their relationship with the expansion of capitalist relation. First, the witch hunt as a persecution particularly fit, you know, to uh, attack communal relation. Uh, using a Marxian terminology, I would say that the witch hunts were a kind of persecution that was perfectly fit, you know, to promote a process of enclosure. Uh, as you know, you know, Marx has told us that the act of birth of capitalism, at least in Europe, uh, was the expropriation of the peasantry from the lands that they had used in common, uh, the expulsions of uh, many, many peasants from their villages, you know, which forced them to become wage laborers. Um, but it has become clear to me in the work that I have done, and certainly because I approach this historical work coming from a feminist background and coming from a background and, uh, and coming from concerns that really highlighted, you know, the question of reproduction, the importance of reproduction in, uh, in uh, our daily life 
and in the history of the political transformation that capitalism has brought about. And because I came, I looked at the history of capitalism from the point of view of the reproduction, and particularly the reproduction of our daily life, the reproduction of the workforce. Uh, it became clear to me that uh, the description that Marx had given us of the process of primitive accumulation and uh, the process of the enclosure was extremely limited, was too limited, that much more actually had been necessary, much more had been required you know, to uh, create a proletariat, male and female, create a proletariat that would be fit for the kind of work discipline that capitalism would be imposing. And I realized, uh, first of all, that the witch hunt was crucial, in fact, not only to the uh, undermine the resistance, people's resistance to the expropriation of the land, but to really break down that thick web of communal relations, you know, which had been rooted in the communal ownership and communal use of land. That the communal use of land that actually created a whole world of communal relation, you know, which the witch hunt served to, to de diffuse and to break down. And I, I, uh, I'm going to very schematically name some of the ways in which this was done. First of all, uh, you know, who was the witch and what was the accusation of witchcraft, right? The, the, the charge of witchcraft, you know, it's the, it's come to, it's come to signify in my mind, to my eyes, it's come to signify the kind of charge that is most uh, apt to, to destroy communal relation. You know, the, the witch is a woman, is a person, generally a woman, who is the enemy of God, enemy of society, enemy of humanity. You know, she was represented as the ultimate, unconditional, absolute evil, as a person who had made even alliance with the devil and uh, whose goal basically was to destroy, you know, the, the, the lives and the properties and the well-being of the people around them. And uh, she's also, or was also the incarnation of uh, what we would call the enemy within. The enemy within, it's, it's a category that represents a person who appears normal, appears uh, like one of us, but then has a double life. And in the case of the witch, it was said that at night she would transform herself. She would fly to distant places. She would attend diabolical meetings. She would take orders for the devil as to who had to be killed who had to be destroyed, whose children had to be uh, basically um, killed. So again, it's a kind of accusation that is apt to generate suspicion, to generate fear, to generate isolation, because particularly when such accusation is repeated over and over, over the course of years, you know, by the authorities, and when it is penalized with incredibly atrocious penalties, in inevitably the effect you know, is, is to paralyze the community, to break down isolate uh, people, to make them, uh, in a sense, retrench you know, into their own private life. So in this way, too, the witch hunt contributed to the destruction of what today we we'll call the commons. And there are many other ways. Uh, for example, as uh, I will uh, show later even more in detail, you know, the witch hunt broke down the, the, the solidarity between women and men, you know, representing women as enemy of men. It broke down the solidarity between old and young, you know, showing, arguing the witches were particularly 
banned on killing children, that uh, witchcraft was uh, a crime mostly exercised, the, the witches were an infanticide sect, right? Also, it broke down the relationship among women. You know, most work uh, in the medieval villages were done collectively. Women worked collectively all the time, and uh, they had very strong ties with each other, you know, and uh, through the process of the witch hunt, that collectivity was broken. Women were forced, they were tortured always to death until they denounced each other, until they denounced all their friends. The question, they would not be allowed to die until they had revealed who were the, all the other women who had conspired, presumably, with them. And finally, but it is not final, actually, more could be said, the witch hunt attacked every form of collective relation and also collective gathering, every collective forms of reproduction, the festivals, the meeting, all those occasions in which the community came together, they began to represent it in a very diabolical way under the, the title of the Sabbath, you know, this horrendous gathering. In many, many, many times, you know, the, the reality of it were really peasant festivals, but they were deformed by the magistrates who clearly were, uh, you know, threatened by any type of such gathering, you know, threatened by the idea that such gathering could promote forms of resistance. So this, I think, is, is extremely important to see because, particularly because uh, when we read the, the description you know, of the demonologies, the description of the crimes of witches and all the confessions that were extorted by women under torture, right? We see, we, we think it's a, everything is mad because the accusations are so fantastic. But what I've been trying to show in my work, and uh, I think it's what, I'm, what I've, my position has been very sound, what I try to show is that be beneath or behind this very fantastic accusation, there were actually policies that were continuous with the kind of changes that were being promoted you know, by, by this proto-capitalist class. And, uh, and, and, and uh, arguing, in fact, that the transformation from a feudal mode of production into a capitalist mode of production was not only a matter of economic change, uh, but actually was a transformation that transformed every mode of life, that transformed social relations, transformed cultural relations. Uh, I also, another argument, that I make is that the witch hunt uh, had a profound impact and in many ways was functional to the transformation that the advent of capitalism brought about in the process of reproduction and the relation between production and reproduction. And I want to say a few things here to clarify what I mean before giving some concrete example to say that with the development of capitalism, uh, again, we don't have only the formation of a wage proletariat, and we don't have only the separation of people from the land, but we have also a profound transformation uh, in the reproduction process. In fact, what we see with the development of capitalist relation uh, it's a kind of bifurcation whereby two spheres of social relations are formed that appear profoundly different. On one side, we have production of goods for the market, you know, where activities are activities that are waged and are recognized as social work. On the other, 
we have the formation, a whole sphere of economic relation that, however, increasingly is invis invisibilized, increasingly disappears as work. And this is the sphere of activities that cater to the process of reproduction, they cater to the reproduction of human beings and to the reproduction of the workforce. And what we find with the development of capitalism and already by the 16th century, and we find that in all the countries they were developing towards a capitalist economy. You know, what we find is that more and more reproductive activities become female labor. In other words, women are confined to this work. Uh, also, more and more these activities, as I said before, you know, appear as no work, become invisible as work. Uh, they, they, in a sense, uh, you know, appear more and more as a social, as a personal service, you know, rather than a terrain, you know, of production. And uh, so, women become identified with the reproductive labor uh, at the very moment when this work becomes totally devalued. So devalued that I mentioned is not even recognized as work. Right? Now, I tried to show, in fact, how the witch hunts, you know, in a way were preparation and had a, a role in preparing a whole population of women right, to become a kind of female unwaged proletariat, uh, a, a position that made them subordinate to men, that made them disappear as work and deprived them even of that social power that the wage has confirmed, you know, to the male proletariat. So um, this undoubtedly, you know, this transformation of women into unpaid worker, it's a process that requires much violence. And it's not an accident that uh, hand in hand to it, you know, we find exactly this uh, in unprecedented surge of violence against women which was the witch hunt. We also have very specific cases, for example, women who insisted in Germany, women who insisted, for example, to sell at the market. Uh, not only women often had to beg the local authorities to be able to continue to work for the market, uh, but uh, those who insisted, for example, carrying on selling in the market often were accused of being witches. Um, there are many other, unfortunately, I have to uh, again proceed very schematically, but I want to say that uh, another way in which the Wichan contribute, you know, to, in a sense, create a new reproductive regime, you know, a reproductive regime in which women will, be, will become uh, unpaid reproductive workers and will become, uh, you'll become more and more subordinate to men, is the fact that the witch hunt you know, served to break down the control that women have had throughout the Middle Ages over the process of procreation. And, you know, we can now smile and, and be skeptic about many of the contraceptive advice and, and uh, tactics that women used in the, the medieval period, but uh, procreation was supposed to be a female mystery. Uh, women gave birth together with other women and there were knowledges, they were passed down from mother to daughter and in the community of women. Uh, the witch hunt literally demonizes all forms of contraception. And uh, for example, by saying, by arguing that witches were primarily an infanticide sect and the one of their enemies, they were enemies of the new life and also they would uh, make men impotent, make women sterile. So women, the connection with, uh, with uh, the question of procreation and procre procreative crimes is very you know, direct. 
And what I've been trying to show in my work is that here again, you can see a direct co correlation with the kind of policies that were being instituted in different regions of Europe, instituted by the state or local authorities, you know, coming from a new class of people right, who were more and more obsessed with the question of demography. You know, uh, capitalism, and particularly the early capitalist class, you know, uh, made of labor, you know, the source of all accumulation of wealth, made of labor more than any other system of exploitation, the capitalist class has elevated labor to the source of wealth and therefore has had to control the production of labor in a way that no other political economic system of exploitation has ever done. And uh, my argument by looking at the legislation that was enacted, that was passed, you know, in the very same period in which witch hunts were taking place, by looking at that legislation, uh, I can see that there is a direct continuity, you know, between the attack on contraception and control of a procreation that the witch hunt instituted and uh, the, led, the, the laws, the policies, the many towns instituted. For example, one of the things that begin to happen in this period uh, in many places is that women have to declare when they're pregnant. Uh, if they do not declare it, and if they later abort, they can be accused of murder. And uh, in several places, in France and also in Germany, system of surveillance of women to see whether they were actually pregnant or not, particularly maids, or they were trying to hide it. So the midwives or the neighbors were recruited, so there actually is a system of surveillance to ensure that the women are not terminating their pregnancy. Uh, so there is a clearly a concern, there is a concern with procreation that can begin to explain some of the charges they were moved against women. So, in fact, my argument is that uh, the advent of capitalism enclosed not only the lands, but also enclosed the body of women in the sense that uh, made it impossible more and more for women to control their reproductive capacity. Um, now, um, again, it's clear that uh, the witch hunt, you know, instituted a whole work discipline, a new work discipline, a new reproductive regime, and that the attack that uh, was moved against women, you know, was precisely, you know, the preparation to a whole set of new tasks that demanded that the social power of women, you know, be, be undermined. You know, particularly that social power that women had gained in the process of the struggle, the anti-feudal struggle. And um, it's not an accident, for instance, that many of the women accused of being witches were women who had some power in the community, like folk healers, women who were doing divination, who claimed to have special power, they were helping people to find lost objects. You know, all those popular powers, uh, you know, really come under attack. And uh, similarly, you know, the world of knowledge is, you know, the women had communicated to each other, transmitted to each other. So we can speak of an enclosure of knowledge. So also, I want to return to this point briefly, the relationship between women and men. Uh, you know, I think that we chant was an important moment in the creation of division, you know, within the proletariat. You know, the, the proletariat that entered the capitalist world is a proletariat that enters divided, and divided not only around racial line, but divided along gender line, because uh, 
one of the things that we chant succeeded to achieve was to convince many men that the power the women had gained were power against them and the women were dangerous you know to their position and to their soul and it's interesting that one of the constant challenges and concerns of the witch hunter was the idea of fascination fascination is a term that comes from the, the witch trial, you know, because the fascination is the ability uh, of women through their body, through their look, right, to dominate the will of men, right, and to make them do uh, what, you know, what they desire, which was something, of course, that had to be demonized since uh, the uh, destination of women you know, to become unwaged reproducers, unwaged reproducers of the working class require a whole subordination to men that would be put in jeopardy, would be threatened if actually women had the power, you know, with their fascination to control the will of men. Now, moving in a sweeping uh, flight, <laughs> Uh, to, to the present, right? moving to a more recent time, and uh, because my other, the other point of my presentation is to show that uh, looking to the past, you know, we can understand something about the present. Looking to the present, I want to say that um, coming with this theoretical and political scheme in mind, we can begin to see why with the advance of globalization, neoliberalism, which has been a major extension of capitalist relation, with that, we have also seen an immense surge of violence against women. So much so that we have also witnessed a return of witch hunting. As you probably know, over the last 20 years, 25 years, in many regions of the world, in many parts of Africa, uh, Asia, uh, in India, for instance, Nepal, Papua New Guinea, and more recently, it's also beginning in uh, Latin America. You know, we have seen uh, new forms of persecution that uh, have led to the murder of many women, in this case too, accused of being witches. Um, unfortunately, very little attention is given to this horrendous phenomenon, a phenomenon that is definitely rooted in the social transformation that are activated by the globalization of the world economy, by the restructuring of the world economy, but very little interest, there seems to be very little interest in the fact that so many women, probably because they are poor women, many of them are peasant women, have been atrociously killed, in many cases still burnt alive, or cut to pieces by machete. Uh, this is not the only form of violence against women. There are other forms of witch hunt that are more indirect, but certainly the rise of violence against women has been a strong component. And I think it's very important to begin to understand why. Uh, and the argument that I, I make is an argument that has certainly been uh, a product also of my understanding of the past, is that uh, one of the roots of this violence is the fact that neoliberalism and the extension of capitalist relation has been a tremendous attack you know, on uh, every form of reproduction, and particularly has been a tremendous global attack on people's access to the most basic means of their reproduction. Wherever you turn, you find that today is extremely difficult for people 
Of course, there are regional differences, but it is extremely difficult for people to have access to the means of reproduction of their life because we have, we have massive land expropriation, and by land I mean expropriation of forests, waters, contamination of, of, of terrains. We have a general precarization of access to income, what we call precarization of work, actually is precarization of income. We have uh, the global uh, disinvestment you know, in social services by the state and local authorities. So we have, in fact, a major attack, and you cannot attack the process of reproduction. You cannot attack without also attacking women who have been and are, to this day, you know, the, the main subjects of reproductive work. And, but I want to go even more specifically on some of the connections uh, and, and some of the specific uh, processes that are stimulating this violence. And, uh, you know, to say that very interesting, you know, uh, as in the past, you know, today as well, we witness this double uh, process whereby more and more women are asked to take on unpaid reproductive work at the same time that unpaid reproductive work and reproductive work in general is being devalued. Uh, to say that, for instance, uh, you have a neo neoliberalism has made its flag of the fact that uh, the market and, and uh, you know, the, the, the market and money are the two uh, major forms, have to be and are the most productive social relations. They are to be the main means of our reproduction. But at the same time, by cutting social services, at the same time, by expropriating people of their land and their access to income, they are also increasing immensely the amount of paid labor you know, that women are destined to. Again, more specific, more specific example. In India, we find, for instance, the many of the witch hunts that are taking place today, you know, are caused, are an effect of the general move towards land privatization and the destruction or the reduction of communal land ownership, right? Uh, one of the effects of the expanding capitalism is that international agencies, for example, the World Bank, but not only the World Bank, are now insisting that everything has to be privatized. Land has to be privatized. And agricultural production has to be placed on a commercial basis. You know, has to be organized for the market. So what do we find? We find that as land is privatized and the title is given, individual titles are given, you know, the, the common is broken up, individual titles are given to the land, the title is given to the men, and women are becoming unpaid laborers. And they are becoming, they are losing their economic autonomy, they are losing access to the commons, and uh, they are becoming helper of the husband. And those who protest are the ones the most likely are accused of being witches. So there's a very direct connection there between witch hunting and privatization of land. We also see in Africa that as we have again massive land privatization, we have mining companies, we have agribusiness, we have agrofuel. You know, and land is becoming more and more scarce. Communal land ownership are breaking down. Uh, we find that men are redefining the laws of the common. They are redefining who belongs and who does not belong to the common. And those who are being excluded are generally women. And so there too, there has been noted a correspondence between the areas in which land was privatized 
or destined to commercial purposes and the frequency of accusations of witchcraft. Again, uh, the devaluation of subsistence farming, which has really been the activity primarily done by women. Right? Again, the World Bank has been on a rampage, on a mission yeah, to declare that uh, subsistence agriculture is the cause of poverty in the third world. Uh, I want to tell you that the World Bank has embraced you know, the theory of the Peruvian economist Hernán de Soto, maybe some of you know de Soto, right? who against a, 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 a tradition thousands of years old, the, the theory of de Soto is that land is non-productive. Only money is productive. So if you have a piece of land, you would be mad to try to live off it. What you should do is take your land, bring it to the bank, and uh, use your land as a collateral to get a loan, a money loan, then you set up a business, and then you leave poverty behind. Well, it doesn't work like that, but as you can imagine. But this kind of propaganda, this kind of ideology, I argue that uh, has had a very profound effect in contributing to the devaluation of a whole population of women and a whole area of s social activities that have been extremely important for the reproduction of many people. In many cases, uh, they have made a difference between life and death, you know, particularly after you know, the imposition of very, very stiff austerity program in the 90s, many communities were able to survive because there was still a piece of land, because there was still something that produced some food. Nevertheless, we have that a massive devaluation and to the point that women are represented, if you read the World Bank report, those who insist in subsistence farming as backward and basically guilty of impoverishing their community. So, the, the, we find the, uh, this kind of ideology has also fomented or at least uh, contributed to a kind of generational gap between the elderly and the new, and the new people. Uh, a generational gap that has played a role in the witch hunt. Because you now have a generation of young people, particularly men, you know, in the countries where you have this persecution Right, who um, see that the money economy as the road to their prosperity. And they are, in a sense, um, in struggle with their elderly who are holding on to a different world of value, to a different conception of life. They don't want to sell the cow. They don't want to sell the trees because their view of the world is that the cows and the trees are really the basis of your security for the future or the piece of land that you have really represent your security for the future. Whereas the, the youngsters would want uh, the land be sold, the trees be sold so that they can maybe rent or buy a taxi because they see the money and there, is be, and there is a whole ideological orchestration that is now contributing to that and in my view is contributing indirectly to the kind of devaluation of women and devaluation of reproduction that is now fostering you know, many, many witch hunt. Uh, more generally, I return to what I said before that with the extension of uh, capitalist relation and uh, the extension of the neoliberal agenda, you know, we find that more and more the situation of women across the world is a situation of tremendous crisis because they now have to take on all their work, all their reproduction work that uh, in the past, you know, was provided by the authority different level, by what we call the welfare state, right? 
and for example also compensate for the increasing contamination of the environment that has a tremendous effect on reproduction and at the same time they also have to uh, provide money for their community so you have these women whose work week is like worse than the, the work week at the industrial revolution time and whose life is now a continuous crisis and that extra work in a way has to be imposed in all kinds of violent manners i want to mention other factors that are contributing to the surge of violence against women and uh, one certainly has been the fact that war now uh, has become a permanent phenomenon and uh, and we witness in conjunction with it we have witnessed a growing militarization of everyday life maybe we can talk about it in the discussion period because this is one of the most infamous development that we have seen uh, we have seen the rise of the number of men in arms and uh, and definitely this has had a, as a direct effect uh, the increase of violence against women and there is a model of masculinity that is being relaunched you know the man with the gun the man with the rifle is being thrown at us in every possible way and uh, in fact it's so interesting to see and the, the american army is uh, the the best example here that even the women who unfortunately have joined the army even those women are not safe in that army even women with the gun are not safe and there's been a high number of women uh, in the american army who have been killed and have been raped and have been the subject of sexual assault but i would say that their rise of uh, arming of armament and warfare of all types that has been required you know if you have a system that is impoverishing people if you have a system based on a constant round of austerity program devaluation of people's life then you need violence to to promote it you need violence to support it and so that of course has had as a reflection right an increase in attack on women and to con to conclude on this point there is also the fact that the crisis of the male wage the crisis of male access to income what some call the crisis of masculinity right has also broken up put into crisis the traditional means uh, of exchange between men and women you know there was this deal based on the wage you know you're a good housewife you're a good mother and so on and then you know you'll be supporting you'll have children whatever one can say of that deal that deal is coming to crisis and today more and more the violence the relation between women and men you know it's now mediated more through violence uh, also because clearly women are fighting to demand their autonomy and one of the way in which that autonomy is being resistant is precisely by violence means now i want to end on a good note <laughs> and say that yes uh, one of the reason why there's been clearly also so much violence against women is because women have made a lot of struggle and uh, and they've made a lot of struggle both to affirm the autonomy to expand the autonomy to make themselves independent and refuse dependence of men but they've also struggled to guarantee some form of survival and reproduction for their communities and i think it's very important today to see and it certainly for me has been and for many women like myself has been a great inspiration that uh, in many parts of the world uh, you know women are coming forward you know in times and in societies that are undergoing very stiff forms of impoverishment you know where you know stiff austerity programs have been imposed 
and in many cases also dictatorial regime, that women are actually coming forward, pooling their resources, trying to create more cooperative forms of reproduction, and in this way, you know, guaranteeing the survival of their community, but also beginning to create some base from which their community can build some resistance resistance to further expropriation and can begin to circulate knowledges, begin to regain some confidence, you know, and begin to open the path to the creation of another forms of life. And in that sense, uh, the, we should not be only discouraged or depressed, you know, by realizing, recognizing, you know, the, the violence that is today being deployed uh, against women as well as against men, but we also should also recognize that the violence is being deployed also because it is attempting to respond to an actual uh, extension of struggles. Thank you very much.